even the wealthy, even those that want the most comprehensive plans, don't really want 50-page reports. And uh, we have really pushed uh, this notion that comprehensive financial plan does not mean a 50-page written document that's going to be handed to your client, have nothing to do with what the actual original uh, needs or wants were, and sit on a shelf somewhere. So uh, that is part of the whole rethinking of financial planning, professional financial planning more generally. Welcome to episode 34 of the Innovating Advice Show. I'm joined by Carrie List, President and CEO of FP Canada, the national professional body leading the advancement of professional financial planning in Canada. In this episode, we discuss how financial planning is evolving, echoing many of the themes on this show, and Carrie shares how FP Canada, which administers CFP certification in Canada, has revamped their entire professional curriculum to align with the changing skills needed by financial planners. We also discuss how technology and emphasizing the human element of financial planning creates opportunities to provide holistic, human-focused financial planning for people with everyday needs, not just the wealthy. Links and show notes at innovatingadvice.com slash episode 34. You're listening to The Innovating Advice Show, and I'm your host, Kate Holmes, bringing you the global pulse on financial services innovation, featuring financial planners, financial advisors, and related professionals from all corners of the globe. Let's dive in. Welcome to the show, Carrie. Thanks, Kate. It's great to be here. So, Carrie, you and I have had the pleasure of working with each other for the last couple of years. You have been involved in the global community for, what, 15 years now as the CEO of the Canadian organization that administers CFP certification. And I remember visiting your office a few years ago, and you guys were undergoing just this massive, impressive project, looking at how to evolve what at that time was the Financial Planning Standards Council. So talk us through how that started in 2015, what you guys have gone through in 2020, and how you ended up with this great, not just a rebranding from a marketing perspective, but rebranding everything you're doing at FP Canada. Absolutely. It, it, I think uh, you put it well. It was a, a massive undertaking, uh, an incredibly ambitious project, and we've now come out the other end. And really, the work has just started based on on, on everything that, uh, that we planned for uh, back in the very early days. I think it started with a board meeting in the fall of 2015, and we launched a task force, an internal task force, in, in February of 2016. And um, the, the, the premise behind it, Kate, was that uh, we, had, uh, we had grown up, uh, so to speak, uh, from uh, our inception in 1995, first uh, certifying in, in 1997, really as a standards setting body, and thus the name uh, Financial Planning Standards Council. It was yep. uh, really just a standards body. Um, and, you know, we had tremendous success. The CFP had been very successful. But, um, and we'd also, I, I should say, uh, really focused on our leadership in the industry. And, and, and at that time, though, that was really in the industry being in setting standards and certifying for uh, financial services or financial planning specifically. But um, the world continued to change pretty dramatically around us. Um, yeah. And, you know, come 2015, uh, we we started to uh, express concerns about where the future uh, may go, what the future may hold, and our role as simply and solely a standards and certification body in a world that was uh, changing so dramatically. So there were a whole lot of of uh, factors and and uh, what we would call uh, the, the notion of the burning platform that uh, caused us to uh, to rethink our future. Um, but uh, I think. Two key elements, um, probably the biggest one, was um, technology, and, and that should be no surprise. Yep. I, think, uh, I think technology and the disruption of technology uh, has been really late to financial services. Way uh, late. Way late. Uh, <laughs> way late. Um, and in fact, I think even in 2015, 2016, it wasn't here yet. And I think it was the foresight and the forward thinking of our board and our uh, executive leadership that said, we've got an opportunity to get out ahead of this and let's do it now. And I think the other, Kate, was just the, 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 
the notion of pillars breaking down everywhere around us, but that included also in the in, in the sort of world of certification associations, standards bodies that these um, what maybe were once considered uh, 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 walls that uh, that could never fall, kind of like maybe the, the the Berlin Wall in 1990. Nobody ever imagined it would fall. Yeah. Um, we saw the potential that those those walls might be crumbling pretty quickly. There's a lot of pressure on um, uh, the notion of uh, certification in and of itself being and testing being uh, being the be all and the end all. And should that really uh, uh, be the the assessment of whether somebody is competent as a professional? Um, and we said, you know, if we don't start to change today and we don't start to rethink our role, we're leaders, we're well respected. CFP is doing well right now. Um, we may lose that position. And so uh, can we and should we be doing more and should we be broadening our scope? And the last thing I'll just mention, Kate, I think that the other big driver uh, was real concerns around um, whether the caliber of professional education had kept up with the caliber of standards and uh, certification. And we weren't really in the professional education business or space. We, we set the, the, the guidelines, but they were all being delivered by third parties, and we really couldn't control that. So that was another big driver. So, Carrie, these are all fascinating. And even now being in, what are we going in, mid-2020, yeah. these are all topics that I feel like are just starting to bubble up a number of other places and are conversations that keep coming through with guests on the podcast from all over the world, whether it's places with established financial planning or that are looking around and kind of going, how can we learn from other countries and maybe leapfrog some of the lessons that, you know, have taken other places years or decades to evolve through and leap straight forward. So let's talk about each of those if we can, starting with technology. So what are you guys doing now at FP Canada in terms of the evolution of technology and, and how it's supporting financial planners? Yeah, I think uh, maybe start, Kate, with just the, 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 the question of what is the impact technology is having or going to have yep. on, uh, on financial services more generally, but uh, financial advice and then most specifically financial planning. Um, as you know, back from, uh, from our days working together on the international front, uh, this has been, there's been a lot of talk, a lot of talk for a lot of years, but I don't think any of us, and I'd say us it, it, it collectively, including ourselves, really have known or understood what it is we're talking about when we talk about fintech, when we talk yeah. about uh, F financial planning technology, when we talk about robo advice. Um, it's been a lot of talk. And um, we started to uh, say, you know, talk with no action is it's great to keep us sort of engaged, but we really need to start um, figuring this out in terms of that crystal ball and, and maybe taking some risks as, 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 in, in terms of where this may go and positioning ourselves accordingly. So uh, we, we started talking obviously with robo firms, uh, robo advisor firms. And, and what we discovered, I think fairly quickly, is that while all these robo platforms, um, and in, in Canada, uh, there's one that has 80% uh, of the Canadian marketplace. So it's, wow. it's, it's called Wealth Simple. It's a, a large investment by Power Corporation, which, uh, which owns uh, big insurance companies and big, and big uh, financial planning firm, uh, firms, actually. Uh, talking with them, talking with others, what we heard was initially, I think that a lot of these tech firms, these fintech firms, thought that they were going to come in, produce uh, online platforms, go directly to consumers, so B2C, and they'd shut down the advice, uh, the advice world. And they realized that that is not going to happen anytime soon, pretty quickly. And there were a lot of players that were in and out pretty fast because they realized uh, or they found that uh, consumers just weren't particularly interested. They, they didn't know what, uh, they didn't even know what they were looking for. And, 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 and that's yeah. typically the <laughs> problem with financial advice these days. So we started talking about, with them and they started saying, you know, this is looking more like it's going to be a, a B2B platform through professional 
uh, advisors, and then in our case, uh, uh, planners. And we can talk about the whole advisor planner thing in a, in, a, in another yeah. segment here. But um, so uh, it was really around connecting with uh, with those firms um, and working out together what might the role be of the technology and what might the role be of the human uh, and how are those two pieces going to uh, going to marry and where we've sort of landed is that technology even robo investment advice platforms specifically and probably even when we start to get into artificial intelligence and and uh, Robo financial planning, which I think will happen to a certain extent. Yep, they can only do so much, and they cannot probably for the foreseeable future. Uh, uh, for sure, probably not in my lifetime. Maybe in your <laughs> lifetime, Kate. But um, going to they're not going to be able to to emulate um, the elements of what uh, a, a professional human professional can do. So with that, we said we need to start really focusing more on. The human side of the professional. We're about the humans, and and we always will be. We may we may look at other opportunities to partner with fintech in more meaningful ways, but we'll we'll always be about the humans, and we'll always be about planning. So, um, you know, sort of that led us to really rethinking the entire curriculum, the entire uh, sense of context of what it means to be a professional financial advisor more generally in this new order. And uh, that led us to a whole bunch of conclusions, uh, one of which is that the future of financial advice is in planning, period. Yep. Um, but the future of planning is in the human equation. And, uh, and that really has driven so much of what we've been doing the past uh, three or four years. And as you said, it's just the start, right? It's, uh, we, 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 we've got uh, you know, a list uh, this long of, of, of ideas and things we want to get we want to get moving on in the next in the next day. <laughs> yeah, Carrie, there's a lot of work to be done. But thinking on the technology side and some of the conversations I've been having lately, it's been so fascinating to me to see now that we're in this pandemic and the lockdown, the amount of advisors all over the world that previously said, no, you can't run a business virtually, you can't operate virtually, they were resistant to all of that. How much do you think what we've experienced these last couple of months will actually help propel people forward in terms of embracing technology for those that still saw technology as more of a threat? Yeah, it's a fantastic point, Kate. And I, I made this comment with uh, with our staff at, at FB Canada is that um, you know, even the notion, I'm, I'm changing subject just as an example for, for a second. Uh, the notion of holding high stakes exams remotely in the comfort of one's home was absolutely, you know, it was taboo. You couldn't even consider it. And I think uh, that's, you know, that's to me one of the best examples because now everybody's scrambling to figure out how they can do it, not if they can do it. And uh, I think it's part of the human condition, Kate. And it, it Going back to your question specifically about the planners and advisors, um, human condition, condition is inertia is a lot easier than uh, embracing change that uh, the notion of change that you don't necessarily have to do today. And so uh, it's uh, I, you know it's nobody's fault. It is it is natural human tendency. Uh, humans don't like change generally. <laughs> and so the other thing is, and there's be, there's some behavioral economics in this, and, and it's it's that. Um, find ways to actually uh, confirm why we can't do things to um, help us make sure that we don't have to change. That is, again, yeah. <laughs> natural human tendency. So here we are. And, you know, it's, uh, we've used, I've used the term adapt or die in, yeah. in, uh, in lots of contexts, uh, speaking to, uh, you know, hundreds and, and thousands of advisors in the big institutions uh, when they've asked me to come and talk to them. And it's deliberately to try to scare them, but this was before COVID. Um, but uh, now um, that is uh, really hitting home uh, much sooner than I thought it was going to happen. But uh, if you can't adapt today to uh, working with technology, working comfortably with technology, um, embracing what some of these fintech firms have to offer to help you, um, and then embracing this kind of you know Zoom meeting, uh, that uh, you're not going to survive. And, and, and I think that. Uh, 
th there's a lot more a lot more advisors that are uh, adapting more much more quickly quickly than they thought. But I think there are going to be potentially a lot more advisors that are we're in the oh I'm five years from retirement you know maybe they're saying going to say it's time now because I don't want to embrace that change so I think we're going to find that that group that says hey this wasn't so bad and out the other end I can serve more clients because I've got the technology to support me I can do yep. more of what I love to do and you know this isn't as great as sitting you know face to face live but it it does a pretty good job of emulating it and um, if you can embrace technology you can get on with more and more of this uh, FaceTime. And it's also a lot more efficient to do it this way than it is uh, having, you know, forcing people to come to your office. Um, so you're going to get that group. And then you're going to get the group, I think, that just can't or don't want to change. Um, and uh, we, we may see a bit more of an exodus, I think, from that side of the market. And Carrie, I love that you are out there just being so bold and blunt and saying adapt or die, especially as your role as CEO of the Canadian organization, you know, overseeing financial planners throughout Canada, trying to evolve the profession. You're just telling it like it is. And that's so, so true. And it's so refreshing to hear. And you mentioned behavioral economics in there. And I know one of the things you guys have added to your education and curriculum, and this has also been a theme coming through. And I have people reaching out to me from all over the world saying, you know, hey, should I get a coaching certificate? Should I right. get CFP certification? You know, and there's this divide I'm seeing happening. And you mentioned it earlier, you touched on it, Carrie, in terms of looking at these pillars coming down and what do you truly need to be a successful professional? Yeah. And it is starting to get a little bit more between those soft skills, emphasizing the more human element and just all of the technical stuff as technology continues to do a lot of that more efficiently, more accurately. And I know you guys added behavioral economics and human behavior to, to your curriculum. So what do those look like and why are those so important? Yeah, uh, just to back up, you said some really important things there, uh, Kate, uh, around, you know, the... I've always had a problem with the notion, with these organizations that talk about uh, this, new, this new profession or new business of life coaching uh, or financial life coaching, when I've always felt that being a financial planner uh, had to be financial life coaching. Yep. And, you know, that there's been, even before fintech, uh, there's, with, with the, the, the commoditization of, of, of information, I mean, just you know, how much knowledge you can gain through the internet uh, is, is for free, um, is, is massive. And um, this is something I think that speaks to the need for all professions to adapt or die. And, you know, I'm also a, a professional accountant by, by uh, original vocation. <laughs> uh, I think the accounting profession is, is at a huge crossroads and is going to struggle a lot more than, than our profession is, frankly, uh, in trying to figure itself out. Um, but the days of being the keeper of knowledge and where being the expert was what people uh, value are gone. Um, and, and even doctors, even medicine, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the head of the uh, American Medical Association was speaking a few years ago about the need for, for the medical profession to change. And, uh, you know, her comment was that the medical profession needs to become much more one of empathetic uh, 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 coaches and, and, and relationship managers. And I think that that goes completely go for the financial planners, and uh, it's all got to be about human behavior. So, with the uh, the change to FP Canada, the creation of the FP Canada Institute, which we decided would include the development of professional education, uh, we said that we're going to revamp the entire professional curriculum, and uh, we've built the uh, professional education programs both for our CFP program as well as our new uh, qualified associate financial planner program on what we call the three H's, just so we can use an alliteration, just so we can remember what it, what it is. But uh, it's, um, it's the human, uh, holistic, and then honest, which is really ethic, ethical, uh, uh, professional. And um, really, the, the, the human side, the holistic is that 
uh, is the whole financial planning piece that, that uh, people uh, don't want advice and shouldn't be getting advice in a vacuum. That's not anything new. That's what started in 1969 with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the beginnings of financial planning in the United States in Chicago. But, um, but, the, uh, but the human side, I think, has just been not getting nearly enough due for many, many years. And, and so you talked about behavioral economics. Absolutely. There is behavioral economics in it, which is the, and this is really not just about empathy. This is about learning scientific principles of how can you get your clients to actually act in their own best interest when half the time they knowingly don't act yeah. in their own best interest. Yeah. And how do you actually learn how to give advice uh, in the client's best interest without building in your own biases unwittingly, et cetera. So that's the whole behavioral economics piece. And we've built a whole uh, one third of the program or more than one third of the program based on uh, these principles of, of uh, behavioral economics, uh, human and client psychology, et cetera. But then there's the other piece that, that uh, isn't the behavioral economics side, but it's still the human side, which is built in there, which is the empathy and, and learning and understanding how important uh, practicing empathy is, understanding your client's needs in a meaningful way, connecting what they really want and need um, to your value proposition. So we have a whole section on value proposition that uh, connects uh, what we call uh, the client's jobs, pains, and gains with what you can offer to actually break down their pains um, understand the jobs they're trying to achieve, i.e., what are they, what are they uh, looking to, 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 to do? And then uh, the gains are, what are the solutions you're going to give them and uh, that are going to actually solve their problems? So that's all built into the whole behavior, human behavior piece as well. And it's, it's exciting and it's a, it's a huge change. And we, we hope coming out of this, there'll be no need for the notion of financial life coach anymore because that's what a financial planner will be. Yes, Carrie, and I couldn't agree more. And I have seen a few things on social media the last couple of weeks, and I've seen people having conversations and posting articles on the difference between financial planners and coaches. And I've kind of bit my tongue and I wanted exactly. to say, you know, I, I respectfully completely disagree because I'm with you. And when I started my prior practice in 2013, it was all really built around coaching because I was like, if you're going to help clients figure out what are those pain points, what do they want? Because honestly, clients don't know. Most planners don't know what they you know, want in their life. We don't Absolutely. always slow down and take time for that. So I completely agree. And so it's good on FP Canada for bringing that into the curriculum. Is it something I can imagine we've got listeners around the world listening to this right now? Yeah. And knowing that you embrace technology, are those modules or continuing education that people around the world could? leverage and learn from? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, we have, you know, we already were biting off more than any 50 person organization <laughs> should be uh, humanly capable of. So we, we've looked at doing this in stages. So, um, and I should say, uh, Kate, just before we, we move on to that, uh, to answer that question, I, 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 this isn't just about uh, us and our bold vision. We actually spent two years uh, putting together a, a, our, our own compelling value proposition for why this is what was necessary. And it was very clear when we went out and talked to employers, to industry firms, the big, all of the big, we have six big finan uh, banks in, 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 in Canada, all of the six big banks. Um, we didn't get anybody saying, you guys are crazy. Uh, in fact, everybody was, they were all saying to us, how soon can you make this happen? Because we're, we're recognizing that that is the future of the human. And we were trying to figure out how to get there. So um, we raised significant dollars um, in advance from, from industry. Um, they've participated in the, uh, the, the development of the program uh, because uh, they saw how important it was. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, um, it was clear to the listeners that this isn't simply about a bunch of crazy people at the <laughs> ivory tower at FP Canada having some bold vision and saying, if, if we build it, they will come. Of course, there was some element of that. My favorite uh, feel-good movie from the 1980s, by the way, <laughs> Field of Dreams. But, um, but it was really um, researched and, and we really uh, uh, had strong support and knew we had strong support from industry. So with that uh, 
a, a qualifier, we've got to start one step at a time. And so the first thing was to get the CFP program revamped. The curriculum requirements changed. Um, we've changed the, the, the certification path as well to actually make it more efficient and to build a professional education program for prospective CFP professionals. That was the first. So that was only in its entirety, the entire package, it's about 21 modules uh, in seven units, uh, had to be packaged and out there um, because we, effective November of last year, the old program ceased to be an uh, eligible pathway. And you now, if you're pursuing CFP, you have to take this professional education program. So we got that out of the way. Um, we ran a pilot earlier last year. It was a huge success. And we went live uh, the end of November of 2019. And we have already uh, about 1,600 candidates registered in this program. So it's been wow. a, a huge success. It's, it's been more than uh, double what we, what we originally expected. Um, Second step, Kate, is to modularize that so that I said there's about 21 modules. We're actually going to create, and we're looking to do this by the end of this year, is to create a series of products. And so we're looking around 20 modules where CFPs can say, I would like to take this particular module. And uh, as they build up their inventory of modules they've completed, eventually they'll be able to get a certificate of completion in this um, sort of 3H financial planning is what we're calling it right now. So that's sort of uh, stage two. We did open one, uh, one module up uh, this year. We got about 500 CFPs already registered, which is the uh, professional ethics, introduction to professional ethics course. But um, all the behavioral stuff will come uh, at the end of this year as part of the modules. And then once that's opened up, then Kate, I think we can look at uh, who else outside of the Canadian CFP uh, prospective and existing CFP uh, world may actually uh, be be interested in this. So it's it's premature right now, but I think it's something we'd certainly uh, we'd certainly be interested in. We've also we're, we've just launched our pilot for our qualified associate financial planner professional education program, and that will uh, probably be relevant to a broader even a broader group because it doesn't have the level of technical uh, detail and expertise required. It it is more focused on uh, what we call typical financial planning for average, uh, average Canadians. So um, that may actually even be more applicable to a broader uh, a swath of, of people, not only in Canada, but, but around the world. That's great. So when that gets available online to, I would say, beyond even planners around the world, Carrie, it's exactly. so great to hear that you got the actual buy-in from the six big banks in Canada, yeah. because one of the big things that I'm seeing, and honestly, I don't feel like this conversation has changed at all over the last 10 years, but it seems to be getting maybe even a little more intense, is the gap between generations. And so you've got the veteran planners that are maybe within 10 years of retirement and they you know, were trained a certain way and they built their businesses a certain way. And then you've got these new planners coming in and you mentioned you know, it's building it for the prospective planners. And so we're starting to see this gap widen of people entering the profession and wanting to do more of that coaching, the more human behavior, potentially more modular financial planning with their clients yeah. versus the more traditional model. What challenges do you see and does FP Canada have ways of helping to bridge that gap, especially as you're sort of evolving and promoting this new curriculum? Yeah, it's a great point. And it, I think it's a real concern. It's a concern. Uh, look, that the, this is not new or unique to our uh, profession or to uh, at right. 2020, right? Uh, yeah. uh, we can, we can uh, identify so many times in so many professions where there's been a disruption that has caused a lot of um, real challenges for the, the, the legacy professionals. Um, so I, I guess a couple of comments, Kate, is that we, we, you know, you talk about my speaking bluntly. Sometimes I guess I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm accused of speaking too bluntly and it can come back to bite me, but uh, I'll try to be as diplomatic as I can uh, when I say this. But uh, I sort of alluded to it earlier. There are some that are just going to say, you, you know what, I've had a good run. Um, it's time for me to pack it in. And, and that's fine. You know, I, I, I think there comes a time where that's appropriate for some people. Um, but, but we are doing one thing we are doing, we've been doing this Kate for, I'd say the last three years during our financial planning week, 
uh, professional symposium, which is a huge event. Of course, uh, it's not going to be quite as huge event this year. Uh, <laughs> we're looking at uh, perhaps a virtual event this year, but um, it's a huge event uh, across the country. But we hold a big symposium in Toronto and Vancouver, um, uh, combined about 600 CFPs attend. And what we've been trying to do really the past three years is speak all, and they're kind of like, there's four different speakers at each event. You've been, I think, to, to one or two. Yep. Um, they're kind of like four little TED Talks, one-hour TED Talks. And we've tried to focus almost exclusively on this changing uh, order, this changing world, and this disruption of not just technology, but the generational shift and what millennials are looking for, and trying to bring planners who perhaps uh, aren't of the millennial generation or more the, the Gen Xers or even baby boomers uh, to help them and to help them along and help them adjust if they want to stick with it. Uh, so I think that, that's been a huge success. It's, it's, it's sort of a whole brand identity we have around these symposium and it's been a very, very well received and, and uh, I think is really, is really helping uh, the, the older generation. Um, but uh, the other problem I think that we have, Kate, and I, I don't know if it was sort of built a little bit into your question, is it's not just the planners. It's the clients of the planners. And uh, we've, heard, uh, we've heard some statistics that say as high as as much as 80% of millennials who are inheriting the uh, advisor from their parents are firing their yep. advisor. And so that's a message we're trying to uh, de deliver and that if it, that it's not just for you, um, that if you think that you're going to be able to keep doing this the way you've always done it, that's probably going to end with the wealth transfer to the next generation. And you better be ready to either jump off yourself or, uh, or transition. So that's a huge, I think that's a huge challenge and a huge issue. And the other issue there is that while we're getting good numbers of CFP professionals, of, 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 of new certificates and new candidates to the profession. We have an older profession. Uh, you know, that they, it's, that it's, it's, it's hard for us to actually replace the number of people that are retiring with new, uh, a new generation. And I think that it's the kind of work we're doing and redefining what it means to be a financial planner, which we hope is going to resonate better with the new generation who may say, hey, yeah, that actually does sound interesting. I can connect with people. I'm all about people, right? Yeah. And I can connect with people using technology. I'm all about people and technology combined. <laughs> I don't want to have to actually see you face to face or talk to you, um, but uh, I, I still want to connect with you. So, Yeah. Well, and that gets to one of the other things is around how consumer needs are changing. And you're right. I've seen that statistic and I don't think it's budged around the 80% of clients that inherit money firing their advisor and going somewhere else. And I think a lot of that does speak to how the end client, their needs and desires are changing, how they want to work with an advisor. Do they want, like I said, that more modular planning versus a big document? Do they want more of that coaching relationship rather than advising and telling? And you touched on the QAFP, the Qualified Associate Financial Planner. Yes. Is that by chance an answer to one of the themes I'm seeing that I love seeing is this desire for people to provide more accessible and affordable advice. And we know there's been a longstanding problem around financial planning being perceived as being only for the wealthy. But yes. look, it's something everyone needs yes. you know, at, at yeah. different levels. So share yeah. what the QAFP is. Yeah. I've got to respond to a few things that you said <laughs> before. Um, another Another thing that we've done is that, um, you know, we abandoned this notion of six-step financial pr planning process a long time ago at FP Canada because it sounds daunting and it, 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 it's not the way people don't want to get professional human advice on a step one, step two, step three, right. step. So it's still there, but it's, it underlies what you know, just what you do naturally. The other thing is, and you just, you know, you just said it, you know, it's right. I, I'll bang on. Is, uh, that's the <laughs> Canadian. Uh, I'll throw that into your podcast from the Canadian perspective. Um, is that people, even the wealthy, even those that want the most comprehensive plans, don't really want 50-page reports. And 
we have really pushed uh, this notion that a a comprehensive financial plan does not mean a 50-page written document that's going to be handed to your client, have nothing to do with what the actual original uh, needs or wants were, and sit on a shelf somewhere. So uh, that is part of the whole rethinking of financial planning, professional financial planning more generally. But to to your other specific question around accessibility, um, when FP Canada was created in 2000, well, it went live in, in April of 2019, um, our new uh, purpose statement was to, um, uh, to uh, champion better financial health for Canadians. Last, uh, last fall, we were reviewing now sort of six months in what our purpose and, and mission mandate are. And we made one really, really key change. And this is something that our board is really big on. And, 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 and I, um, I think it's really important and it's really exciting is we added a word and we added the word all. And we said, champion better financial wellness for all Canadians. And awesome. that is, um, that's a big, big change. Financial planning has always been for everybody, but it's not being accessible. And it, it, the, the way that the, the, the way that people are, are uh, compensated for their planning um, makes it hard to actually be able to serve uh, clients who don't have the resources to pay, don't have the investable assets because it, so much it, it's based on investable assets. So we, we again, when we, we looked at, uh, at reaching out to industry and we saw industry was already, employers were already starting to, to try to figure this out. And this notion of a financial advisor being something different from a financial planner who can maybe serve those who weren't quite as wealthy, um, but was ill-defined, uh, uh, was starting to take hold. And we said, hang on a second here. Don't all your clients, whether they're frontline walk walk-ins at a bank who want to see a quote financial advisor, don't they have the same wants and needs as the wealthy? And in fact, isn't it going to be a lot easier to service them quickly with really good sound professional advice by people who don't necessarily have to have the same level of technical uh, uh, knowledge because they're not dealing with uh, with uh, uh, big family trust issues. They're not dealing with you know second and third properties. They're not dealing with all the complexities of of uh, wealthy um, businesses where they're trying to figure out how to how to uh, sh- shift their income around, et cetera. And aren't they really looking for all the same three H's? Aren't they looking for a holistic view of their lives? Aren't they looking for the human touch? And don't they need it and want it and deserve it uh, as a, pr- a true professional? And that, that's all about being putting your clients always ahead of your own interests, which is the ethics piece. That's the three H's. That's the three H financial planning. So what we came up with is a new credential in the image of CFP, the same 3H financial planning, but directly geared towards average Canadians with typical financial planning needs where you don't need to go through a three-year program. It could maybe be 18 months, kind of like, I don't know if you have paralegals in the United States. Uh, yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, or, or the difference between... A, uh, a registered practical nurse and a, and a nurse practitioner. Yeah. Uh, so consummate professionals, client interest first, um, all of the competencies that are the same competencies that you would have as a financial planner and all of the three H's, the human, uh, holistic and honest, uh, but geared towards everyday needs. And so that was how the QAFP was born. Um, it is a qualified associate financial planner. We needed to keep financial planner in there because this isn't about one-off financial advice. It has to be holistic. It has to be seeing your client as a whole because people don't live their lives in silos. Why should you get your advice in a silo? So yes. um, that's the sort of the, the notion behind the QAFP. We just went live April 29th, I think, with our pilot. Oh, wow. We have about 65 students in the pilot. So we're very excited about that. And uh, we have, uh, we've kicked it off. We, 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 we brought over about uh, 4,000 uh, previous level one certificates and, and a few 
from a competing designation. One of the big banks in Canada brought them over from a competing de designation. Um, we've given them um, the QAFP certification. So we have about 4,500 people Jan 1 of this year that have QAFP, but they'll have to complete the program with this uh, QAP professional education program, the 3H financial planning program by July of next year in order to maintain their certification. So we've got already a huge pipeline, 4,500 people in the pipeline. Wow. And we have about uh, 65 uh, right now in the pilot. So we're really, really excited because we believe that all Canadians deserve financial planning. And these are individuals who won't demand seven, you know, six and a half, you know, $200,000 a year. They'll be able to also serve a lot more clients because the, the complexity of the needs of their clients is much less. They'll be able to have more clients, help more clients, and still make a good living and, and still be um, productive and still do well for their, for their employers in, in the case that they're, they're employed. That is awesome. Carrie, this has been such a refreshing conversation. Like I said, all the themes that are coming through that I'm having around the world, hearing that it's stuff that FP Canada is already ahead of, as you said in the beginning, it's it's rare to actually sort of be ahead of the curve and looking forward. I love how direct you are. I love that you're out there just telling people, look, adapt or die. The time is now. There are so many great tools and FB Canada is providing tools to help people adapt, get those more human behaviors. This is awesome. Carrie, thank you so much for your time. What final thought would you leave listeners with and how can they learn more about FP Canada? Yeah, a, a, a couple of quick quick thoughts is, uh, you know, you said the adapter diet. Look, I think that that um, it's daunting, but it's also exciting. We're we're living, you know, once we get over the the, the, the pandemic, and it will it will end, but the world uh, has forever changed, yep. and we're positioned as a profession to be able to actually adapt far more quickly than almost any other profession. So let's embrace that. Let's yeah. be excited by that. And let's go out there and change so that we can actually help more world citizens around the world and make a good living at the same time. So that's exciting. Um, if you want to follow us, uh, you can follow us uh, on Twitter at our uh, official FPCAN um, Twitter handle. We also have a great consumer site that we try to uh, send uh, send some of this uh, this knowledge to and information. It's uh, Financial Planning for Canadians. One big long word: Financial Planning for Canadians. <laughs> ca, and uh, we'll be uh, looking at uh, at uh, continuing to to uh, develop that. And I would say stay tuned because there's probably this time next year going to be a whole lot more um, of new ideas that have already been implemented that we're, uh, we're continuing to move forward uh, with at FP Canada. So hope we can talk again, maybe, uh, this time next year and talk about uh, how things are gone and hopefully a post COVID-19 world. Yes, hopefully. I would love to have you on again next year. If things change later this year, we'll play it by ear. But yep, let's sure. make this a regular thing and, and see how Canada is continuing to be out in front of everything. Thank and thanks, you, for, thanks for doing what you're doing, Kate. I think it's, it's, really, uh, it's really needed. Uh, we, need to, we need to get the, 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 the voice from, voices from around the world and, and uh, start talking about the future, not the past. Yes, agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Innovating Advice Show. I'd love to hear your thoughts, so make sure to connect with me on LinkedIn and shoot me a thought or two. Link to my profile is right below. Stay safe, stay well, and I look forward to hearing from you.